الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله له الحمد في السراء والضراء وله الحمد حين البأس وله الحمد على كل حال وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله قل اللهم مالك الملك تؤتي الملك من تشاء وتنزع الملك ممن تشاء وتعز من تشاء وتذل من تشاء بيدك الخير إنك على كل شيء قدير وأشهد أن سيدنا وهادينا وإمامنا وأميرنا محمدا صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم عبد الله ورسوله وصفيه وخليله محمد رسول الله والذين معه الشداء على الكفار رحماء بينهم من يطع الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فلا مضل له ومن يعص الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فلا هادي له أما بعد Committed Muslims يقول الله سبحانه Allah states in our book of instructions the beginning of Surah Al-Isra or Bani Israel سبحان الذي أسرى بعبده ليلا من المسجد الحرام إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله لنريه من آياتنا إنه هو السميع البصير وآتينا موسى الكتاب وجعلناه هدى لبني إسرائيل ألا تتخذوا من دوني وكيلا ذرية من حملنا مع نوح إنه كان عبدا شكورا وقضينا إلى بني إسرائيل في الكتاب لتفسدن في الأرض مرتين ولتعلن علوا كبيرا فإذا جاء وعد أولاهما بعثنا عليكم عبادا لنا أولي بأس شديد فجاسوا خلال الديار وكان وعدا مفعولا ثم رددنا لكم الكرة عليهم وأمددناكم بأموال وبنين وجعلناكم أكثر نفيرا إن أحسنتم أحسنتم لأنفسكم وإن أسأتم فلها فإذا جاء وعد الآخرة ليسوء وجوهكم وليدخلوا المسجد كما دخلوه أول مرة وليتبروا ما علوا تتبيرا عسى ربكم أن يرحمكم وإن عدتم عدنا وجعلنا جهنم للكافرين حصيرا These are obviously extended ayat 
And as you may have noticed in many previous khutbas, I would do just with one or two ayah and relay to you the meanings of the context. In this case, because the issue is sensitive, the issue is almost absent from our functional lives, it is necessary to cover this range of ayat. I want you, I'm not going to translate the ayat. Anyone can refer to the first several ayat in Surat Bani Israel, otherwise known as Surat Al-Isra, the night journey. <coughs> I want you to understand the following absent ideas about these ayat. The first one is <clears throat> the Muslims, I'm not trying to be pessimistic and I'm not trying to take away the winds from our sails. Just trying as much as is humanly possible to diagnose our condition and to shed light on how we should proceed in the right direction. The first issue that is virtually absent from the Muslim public mind is the word Bani Israel that has that occurs scores of times in the Quran. It's not the first ayah or the first ayat in which the reader of the Quran comes across those two words, Bani Israel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a certain segment of people throughout history with this specific description, Bani Israel. There is another wording in the Quran that refers to another psychology of people. And this wording in the Quran is Al Yaqub. It is still not clear, even in some of the minds of enlightened Muslims. It is still not clear and it is still not explained in a clear way to the average Muslim what the difference is between Bani Israel and Al Yaqub. These are Quranic terms. And there's a difference in definition and a difference in meaning between these two aggregates of people. Bani Israel in most of their history as the Quran presents them to us are assailed. They are taken to task. They are faulted. And the easy way to understand Bani Israel, we live in a real world. And there are real issues that irritate us in the real world today. No one uses the word Bani Israel. But there's something you know because you've experienced it. It's called either racism or nationalism. 
The character of Bani Israel in history has converted Allah's guidance into racism and nationalism. And they've given themselves the license to do with other people whatever they want to do without a prick in their conscience. And you trail these words in the Qur'an whenever you come across Bani Israel. We don't have to mention the many ayat that should be very clear to us. But what is not clear is the element of racism, nationalism, tribalism, self-centeredness, egotism in society, in politics, in the military, in education, in the media, all over the place. On the other hand, there's the word al Yaqub. لِيُتِمَّ نِعْمَتَهُ عَلَيْكَ وَعَلَىٰ آلِ يَعْقُوبِ Aya in Surah Yusuf. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say لِيُتِمَّ نِعْمَتَهُ عَلَيْكَ وَعَلَىٰ بَنِي يَعْقُوبِ You will not find anywhere in the Qur'an where Allah says آل إسرائيل Nowhere in the Qur'an where Allah says, Bani Ya'qub. There is a progeny and a posterity that belong to the same person. One designation has him called Israel. The other designation has him called Ya'qub. And still in our mind there is not a well-established demarcation line between these two sets of affiliations, which opens the door for the wars that we are encountering. We're a victim of the same mistakes and offenses that were committed by Bani Israel in their history. And there's another word that we come across and that we sort of are satisfied with the simplistic translation of it. And that word is Al-Asbat. One of the ayahs that mention this word قُولُوا آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ وَمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْنَا وَمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْمَعِيلَ وَإِسْحَاقَ وَيَعْقُوبَ وَالْأَسْبَاطِ وَمَا أُوتِيَ مُوسَىٰ وَعِيسَىٰ وَمَا أُوتِيَ النَّبِيُّونَ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ لَا نُفَرِّقُ بَيْنَ أَحَدٍ مِّنْهُمْ وَنَحْنُ لَهُ مُسْلِمُونَ Please, when you read the Qur'an, try to develop an understanding of these words so that you can understand what is happening in the world today. The Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not mentioning these issues to us because they are academic, because they are some type of historical information. They have an immediate impact on our world and our condition today. The other issue that has to be brought out, which is not very clear in the Muslim general mind, is that these ayat were revealed When the Prophet of Allah was basically expelled from his own society, from his own culture, from his own people, 
Mecca did not want Muhammad. They were not, by and large, they were not responsive to what he was trying to explain to them. He felt lonely. He felt isolated, estranged, alienated, excommunicated. You name all of these synonyms and they were part of him when these ayat were revealed. And then, uh, so what is the condition here? It's the condition of, oh Allah, I have no power. I have no status. I have no influence. I have nobody. And he expressed this in his dua on his way out of Al-Ta'if when he knew Mecca was no longer an area, a people responsive to him. He went seeking some type of help, some type of acceptance in Al-Ta'if. And when he realized Al-Ta'if was behaving like Mecca, the people of Al-Ta'if were also shunning him, accusing him. He said his famous dua, which we repeat. Sometimes at the end of the khutbahs here on Friday. But one of those sentences is, فَإِلَى مَنْ تَكِلُونِي إِلَى غَرِيبٍ يَتَجَهَّمُنِي أَمْ إِلَى عَدُوٍ مَلَّكْتَهُ أَمْرِي To whom do you refer me? To a stranger who turns his face the other way? Or to an enemy who has my affair in his hands. Anta Rabbi wa anta Rabbul Mustadhafeen. You're my sustainer and you're the sustainer of the Mustadhafeen. This is what he said. And being in that psychology, in that social reality, these were the ayat that were revealed to him. Some, and then after that, or during this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him on the miraculous journey that did not go from Mecca directly to As-Samawat al-Ula, to Sidrat al-Muntaha. It wasn't like that. It went from Mecca to Al-Quds, and then from Al-Quds up to the end of time and place. Was this perchance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose Al-Quds? He didn't choose any other place on planet earth. And some people would like to give priority to other cities over Al-Quds. I don't want to be specific. I'll get on some people's nerves. Suffice it to say, the Prophet ﷺ, in these acrimonious, divisive, challenging times, Allah responded by bringing him into his presence. The Prophet was always in Allah's presence. But Allah wanted to show him that he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is always in the Prophet's presence. It's easy to understand it one way and not understand it the other way. This is 
Also, an issue that is absent from people who speak about this day, the issue of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, the intractable feuds and wars that go on in that sacred part of the world. Another issue, which I will try to end with in this first khutbah that is also absent from us when we try to reflect on the meanings of Ramadan, the meanings of abstaining from our aptitudes and our desires. Another meaning is some people say, oh, this person who gives the khutbah on the sidewalk, he speaks about issues of the world. There's not very much attention paid to the issues near, the issues here. We don't make a distinction, for those who repeat these types of words, we don't make a distinction between an issue here and an issue at a distance. They are related. And let me try to... I mean, I can say this, and someone will argue something else, and it'll just be a back and forth. But our frame of reference is Allah and His Prophet. If there's some type of disagreement we have among ourselves, we refer the issue to Allah and His Prophet. Fine. When the Muslims, the few Muslims, what were they? No one knows exactly, but let us say between 50 and 100. When they were with Allah's Prophet, and they were collectively excommunicated. Quraysh, the system, the ruling party in Mecca, they posted a notice on the Kaaba that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and all of those who are with him are to be shunned excommunicated, avoided by everyone. You don't speak to them, you don't transact with them, you don't communicate with them, you do nothing with them. And so these Muslims, these committed Muslims with Allah's Prophet, were confined to A place in Mecca called Shi'ab Abi Talib. They remained in this condition three years. It was so difficult on them that at times those who needed nutrition would chew on leather. That's how difficult they were in, the conditions that they were living. As they were in this state, imagine how they were, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the ayah in the Quran that says, غُلِبَتِ الرُّومُ فِي أَدْنَ الْأَرْضِ وَهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ غَلَبِهِمْ سَيَغْلِبُونَ فِي بِضْعِ سِنِينَ The Muslims are starving. The Muslims are wasting away for three years in that local condition in Mecca. And then the ayah from Allah Jalla wa'ala says to them, غُلِبَتِ الرُّومُ فِي أَدْنَ الْأَرْضِ وَهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ غَلَبِهِمْ سَيَغْلِبُونَ 
the, Byz- the Romans, the Byzantines have been defeated at a close distance on earth and they shall score a victory after their defeat. Now, you tell me an area like that taking some of the minds around us who say, look at these Muslims, they speak so much, meaning the Muslims here on the street, this Jumu'ah khutbah, they speak so much about these issues that are far away from us, why can't they get themselves involved in our predicament, in our local issues? We are not trying to look the other way and say we don't have local issues. What we are trying to do is connect the local issue with the global issue. They cannot be disconnected from each other. Which also, with a further thought, that's all that's required. Just think a little. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending these words from on high to these number of people who are in dire need of survival in Mecca, when he speaks to them about the Romans and the Persians at war with each other, what does that have to do with them? A person would ask, what does that have to do with us? Look at what we are in. Couldn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speak more to our local condition? This is what happens when we live in a schizophrenic mind, we think that something that's happening here has nothing to do with what is happening a thousand or more miles away. And vice versa, what is happening thousands of miles away have nothing to do with what we are dealing with here. This attitude, this approach, this mindset has to stop and we have to be able to become the integrative Muslims who can understand these issues as they are. We're not working things in, we're not working things out. We are trying to understand them exactly as they are referencing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his beloved prophet may allah's peace and blessings be upon him and his and he says the prophet says man asbaha wa lam yahtamma bi umur al muslimina fa laysa minhum whoever begins his day and is not concerned with the affairs of the muslims he didn't say the muslims next door or the muslims a continent away. He said the Muslims period. And when you say, think about this, we, we all pray, Alhamdulillah. When you say in your Fatiha, everyone says this, Ihdina as-sirat al-mustaqeem, guide us. Who's the us here? Who are you talking about? Have you ever asked yourself just to define for your own heart and your own mind who the us is here? Does it exclude many Muslims? Does it exclude madhabs? Does it exclude nationalities? Does it exclude distant Muslims? من أصبح ولم يهتم بأمور المسلمين فليس منهم صدق رسول الله أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ادعوه سبحانه وأنتم على يقين بالإجابة وتوبوا إلى الله إن الله تواب رحيم الحمد لله بجميع المحامد على جميع النعم وصلى الله وسلم على المبعوث خيرا ورحمة وهدى لكافة الأمم 
محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم In the uh, short time that we have, we have to be leaving here a little earlier than normal. Within this, these several minutes that we have, I, I want to mention the following to respond to some of our brothers. They're wrong, but they're still brothers. Respond to them who say, some of them have the courage to come and frankly and with a smile on their face, very brotherly, very cordially, they will say, and they, I've heard this, I'm not making things up. See brother, we have worked out our relationship. These are our Irani brothers. I have, to, I have to be a little more specific. I can't name the person, obviously, in the khutbah. A couple of years ago, it comes up and says, See, dear brother, we worked out our issues with the United States. And we will also work out our issue with the Saudi rulers. What do you, he said, asked me, what do you think? I said... I don't want to comment on your first sentence, but on your second sentence, you're going to work out these issues with the Saudi regime. I seriously and brotherly disagree with you. Now, at least this person had enough frankness and enough fraternal attitude to divulge what is inside of him. Now, there are others who carry the same idea. They are convinced, but they don't have the courage to come and say that in public. And we would like to remind them of the following. This new crown prince, the king's son now in the Arabian Peninsula, he said on public TV broadcast all over the place just a few weeks ago he said to the something to the effect that we will take this war inside of Iran those were not his exact words but those were the meanings of what he was saying this was before he was crowned prince He's 31 years old. We don't use street language in the khutbah, but permit me on this occasion to borrow a word from street language and say he's a punk. He wants to take this war. Now Israel and Zionism don't exist any longer. They are obsessed with hatred and animosity towards the only Muslims in the world who are capable of showing the rest of the Muslims what it means to have Islamic self-determination. And then the, th the theater, the day before yesterday, This crown prince goes to his cousin, who was just hours before that the crown prince himself. And he was unseated from his position by the king. And the king replaces him with his son. He goes to him, and this is also on TV and all over the place, he kisses his hand. The king to be kisses the hand of his cousin who was removed from being the king to be. And then the camera shows us that he wants to go down, the king to be, wants to go down and kiss the feet of his cousin. Theatrics. And then... He says, the deposed 
crown prince says to the incoming crown prince, Allah, may Allah help you. And then he says, Ana ertaht, I'm now relieved. And then Muhammad ibn Salman, the crown prince, says to him, Allah, may Allah honor you. La nastaghni an tawjihatik. We cannot do without your directives or your instructions or your counsel. We cannot do without them. Today, the khatib in the haram in Mecca expresses a dua for the king to be. And he says, اللهم أصلحه وأصلح به وانصر به الإسلام والمسلمين O Allah, guide him and cause him to be the guidance of others and give victory by him to to Islam and the Muslims. And then today, this crown prince, still 31, in a couple of months he's going to be 32, This crown prince donates $66 million to the victims of cholera in Yemen. We don't know if this donation is going to reach those victims, but he would do the health of the Yemeni people a grand good if he stopped his declared war. This was the same person who put together this war, Asifat al-Hazm. And then this soft coup in Saudi Arabia reminds us of the hard coup in Iraq. After the Islamic revolution in Iraq took place, in Iran took place, Saddam engineered a revolution, uh, a coup d'etat against Ahmed Hassan al-Bakr, the president of Iraq at that time, preparing for the war. This was not a military coup like the one in Iraq. This was a family coup. And for those who are deluding themselves, you heard it here first. This is in preparation for war. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan warzuqna attiba'ah. وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه ولا تجعله ملتبسا علينا واجعلنا للمتقين إماما اللهم انصرنا بالحق اللهم انصر الحق بنا اللهم كن معنا ولا تكن علينا أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءُ اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم بارك على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على إبراهيم وبارك على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر ومن أظلم ممن منع مساجد الله أن يذكر فيها اسمه وسعى في خرابها أولئك ما كان لهم أن يدخلوها إلا خائفين لهم في الدنيا خزي ولهم في الآخرة عذاب عظيم إن الله يأمركم أن تؤدوا الأمانات إلى أهلها وإذا حكمتم بين الناس أن تحكموا بالعدل إن الله نعم يعظكم به إن الله كان سميعا بصيرا ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقم الصلاة Vamos, vamos,
الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله